College students, how are we? Well, good to see you. I'm excited to be here with you tonight. I said I was going to open up the next couple of weeks just by telling you something about me that you may not already know. It's always helpful when you're going to listen to some guy speak for 30 minutes. You're like, who are you? Where do you come from? Okay, so I'm trying to tell you a little bit about me each week. One thing you may not know about me is I was not like groomed to be a preacher growing up. It's not like my dad was a preacher and my granddad was a preacher. My great granddad was a preacher. It wasn't, that, it wasn't the case at all. Actually, as a teenager, I did subcontract work for a company called Microsoft and was into computers. I was a network administrator, also at an internet service provider. So I did kind of, kind of a computer geek was a label often given to me as a teenager. So nobody thought a computer geek would ever become a teacher or a pastor of any number of people. And little after my teenage years, my early 20s, I started leading worship, actually, at a church I was attending. So I learned to play guitar, started singing. It sounded nothing like this, okay? It sounded like a computer nerd who just got kicked in the groin, all right, when I was singing, Lord, I lift your name. I mean, it's kind of how it sounded, okay? It wasn't good. And ended up going to seminary and then started teaching in a number of different environments. But just want you to know, it's not really my background. My background is in the IT field as a computer science major at Texas Tech. And this is what God called me to do, so this is what I'm doing today. Well, we're in a series called Breaking Free. This is part two. Just curious, how many of you guys were here last week for part one? Just curious. Okay. Just curious, how many of you guys have never been before? It's your first time tonight. Aren't we glad they're here? Aren't we glad? Thank you all for coming. Serious. Hope you enjoy the evening. Well, so basically what we've been uh, saying in this series is we're going to be talking about how to break free from the addictions that control us. And we defined addiction last week as this. Simply, out of Romans 7, Paul said, it's like practical slavery to sin. So a drug addiction is practical slavery to drugs, or an alcohol addiction is practical slavery to alcohol, or porn addiction is practical slavery to porn. You get it, and there's all these different things we can be addicted to. And so we define that, and we saw that uh, Paul basically said in Romans 7, the first step to breaking free is we've got to come to the point where we admit we have an addiction. And we said that while most of us do, most of us are a practical slave to some sin, most of us don't want to admit it. Because we don't want to be that addict or that person that says, hey, I have a problem. I mean, it just makes you seem like you're not perfect. And we all seemingly want to seem perfect, even though everybody knows that we're not. So we said, first step, if you really want to break free from the addictions that control you, from your practical slavery to some sin, first step is you've got to admit you've got a problem. Admit that you're addicted to something, that you need help. Admit that you can't overcome it on your own. This is all from last week. You can catch it online if you missed it. But admit, admit that you can't overcome it, and then admit that you need Jesus' help. And we said the good news from last week was Paul said the answer for our addictions, the answer in order to break free from the things that seem to control us, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he said, Romans 7. Like so the whole series, I gave away the whole series first week. The answer, the answer you're looking for, the answer I'm looking for, Paul says it's in Jesus it's in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now again, we said as Christians, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we can be practical slaves of sin, but we're not positional slaves of sin. You'll remember this from last week, right? We're not slaves of sin. That's not our position before God. We've been set free from sin. And we're slaves, the Romans would say, of righteousness. We're servants of Jesus, not slaves of sin. But we can practically live as slaves of sin, even though we're not slaves of sin, even as Christians, because we struggle maybe with the same sin over and over again. And we define that as addiction, practical slavery, not positional, but practical slavery to some sin. So first week we said, you want to break free? We're all saying we want to break free. First week, you got to admit you got a problem. And this week, I want to show you second step. And just so you know, the next couple of steps to breaking free, they're all like sub-steps or sub-points. These are ways Jesus helps us break free. But the answer to what you're going through, to what I'm going through, to the sin struggles that we have, is Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you've got a Bible, James chapter 5 is so where we're going to be tonight. James 5. If you don't have a Bible, uh, I think we have some in the back that look like this. They're just New Testaments. We'd love to give you one. Or you can pull out your iPhone or your smartphone. If you don't have a dumb phone, this will work. All right, a smartphone. You can get a Bible app on there, and you can look this up. But James chapter 5, verse 16 is kind of interesting. James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. Same mom, different dad. Jesus was the son of God. James, son of Joseph and Mary. Mary was Jesus' mom as well. And so we've actually got an ancient document written by the brother of Jesus. It's been preserved for us for generations. It's pretty fascinating. 
And what you need to know about James, if you didn't already know this, is James being Jesus' brother, they grew up together. James didn't believe his brother was who he claimed to be. I mean, what would your brother have to do to convince you he was the son of God, okay? He couldn't do it, right? I mean, how, how would your brother convince you of that? Well, you can imagine James had trouble believing. I mean, all growing up, he was just probably wishing Jesus would get spanked. Mary, would you spank Jesus? I get spanked all the time. He's like perfect in every way. They're like, he is. You better straighten up. You need to be perfect too. I mean, you, you know that sibling, all right? You hate them, okay? So James didn't believe his brother was the son of God. Are you kidding? Until he saw him risen from the dead. The Bible records that James actually saw his brother. You know what happened once he saw his brother? He wrote a letter saying he was a slave of his brother. He came to believe in his brother, became a Christian, actually became a senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Is a big old church. He was scattered out years later by persecution. And he writes him a letter. It's called James. And he's challenging him because they're struggling. They're practical slaves to some sin. They're addicted to some things. And so in James 5, he kind of tells them how to break free. He tells them a step they can take toward breaking free. It's pretty fascinating that you can read in your Bible, James, a letter the brother of Jesus wrote. It's crazy that he starts out his letter in James 1, if you were to read it, by saying, I'm James, a slave of my brother. So he goes from not even believing his brother was who he claimed to be to James, I'm a slave of Jesus. So if you have trouble with the whole Christianity thing, you're trying to figure this out, why should I believe this? Uh, what's pretty interesting is you got a letter in your New Testament, an ancient document preserved well for us, a brother of Jesus saying he's a slave of his brother. He didn't believe in him when he was growing up. It's pretty fascinating evidence Jesus really did rise from the dead because it would take that for your brother to prove to you he was the son of God. So they're struggling with some sin. They're practical slaves to some sin up in James' church. He writes to him and he says this in James chapter 5, 16. He says, you want to break free? Here's what you got to do. James 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. <laughs> now you can imagine them reading this going, we ain't doing that. Uh-uh. I'm not doing that. Like I'll admit, James, here's the thing, James Church probably thinking this. We think the same thing. Hey, I'll admit I got a problem. I'll admit it to God. I'll admit I'm an addict. I'm addicted to something. I got a problem. I will admit that. But confess it to other people? Mm-mm. I ain't doing that. Pray, ask somebody to pray for me? No, it's kind of like humiliating. That's like I got a problem. I ain't, doing, I ain't doing that. And see, James was written to his church, but we can also read James and, and realize that we can apply this to our own lives. So it's like he's saying, hey, you want to break free? The answer is in Jesus. One of the ways Jesus helps you is you confess your sin to other people. You let other people know, I'm struggling with an addiction. I'm struggling with a... With a persistent sin that I continue to commit over and over again. I have trouble controlling it. You confess to each other and then you have somebody pray for you. Now I'm sure they're reading this going, why would I do that? Like why would I do that? Look at what he says next. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that, here's why, so that you may be healed. Here's the reason I want you to confess your sin one to another because when you do and people pray for you, you get healed. Like from your practical slavery to sin. Like you start to break free. You see, a key to breaking free is confession. And here's why. Here's what James is trying to tell them. And if you're taking notes, I'd write this down. Because other people praying for you is more powerful than just you praying for you. That's why confession can lead to breakthrough and can lead to you breaking free. Because other people praying for you, you confessing to somebody you got a problem, asking them to pray for you, other people praying for you is more powerful than just you praying for you. That's why James is telling his church, hey, tell one another what you got going on in your life, what you're struggling with, because then they can pray for you. That's more powerful than just you praying for you. He goes on and say same thing. He says, so the earnest prayer of a righteous person, James saying this to his church, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So he's like, hey, 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 you guys, in your struggles, your addictions, you want to break free? Yeah, we want to break free. Here's what you need to do. Confess your sin to each other, and here's why. Because you get your brother, your sister in Christ praying for you, there's great power there. And it produces wonderful results. Like you'll be healed. You'll break free. It's a step toward freedom from the sin that entangles your life, that's ruining your life. He's saying, get a righteous person, like a friend who's a believer, to pray for you, and there's power there. There's still power when people pray. God loves to answer prayer, and wonderful results will take place. So he's saying, you want to break free? Here's what you need to do. You need to recognize the answers in Jesus. 
But then you need to confess your sin, like to, to your friends, to a group of people. Ask them to pray for you. And when they do, their prayer is going to have great power. And it's going to produce wonderful results in your life. That's what James is saying to his church. That's what he'd say to this group. Same thing. Hey, you want to break free? Hey, start confessing to people you got a problem. Get them praying for you. And the prayer offered in faith by a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Another thing about confession is that now you got a friend knows your issues, then keep you accountable in your struggle. They call you, ask you how you're doing. You call them when you're struggling. It's all out there. They already know. They can check up on you, and you can call them if you got an issue, and, and you got somebody to talk to about it. You've kind of come out of hiding. So if you take a note, second step to break free, first step, you got to admit you got a problem. Second step, you got to confess this to somebody. What you've been hiding, a lot of you are hiding something. A lot of you are keeping a secret. What you've been hiding, James is saying, you want to break free? You need to get it out in the open. You need to humble yourself. You need to tell some people. You need to ask them to pray for you and watch what God does in your life. Second step is to confess. And you know what great context for confession? Or groups of believers that get together to grow spiritually together. We call them at our church LTGs, Life Transformation Groups. We've got a number of them that meet just for college students. And one of the questions they'll ask often when they get together, guys with guys, girls with girls, is they'll say, hey, how are you struggling? And how can we pray for you? And so guys can go around in a circle, or girls can go around in a circle and say, I'm struggling with this. Would you pray for me? Yeah, yeah, we will. And then you get back together the next time. They say, hey, how are you doing with that? I've been praying for you about that. It's a great context to be able to share, hey, I'm struggling with this. Would you help me? Would you pray for me, recognizing we, the reason we set it up this way is because we recognize how powerful that is. And like James said, that itself, Jesus can use that act of confession and having people pray for you to lead you to freedom, to lead you to break free. So if you're not involved in an LTG, oh my goodness, you want to break free from the sin that entangles you, from the addictions you're struggling with, man, you got to get involved in one. you got to have a group of guy friends, a group of girlfriends, you can say, I am struggling with this. I can be open with you about this. I'm struggling with it. Would you pray for me? And then you'll do the same for them. And you'll notice a lot of people say some of their best friendships are formed in these groups because you're open with each other. You're not hiding things. You're not keeping secrets. James is saying it's so important if you want to break free to confess your sin to other people. It's the second step. You've got to get it out there and quit hiding. Quit acting like you have it all together. You know you don't. We know you don't. Quit acting like you do. If you want to be set free, quit acting like you're perfect. You're not. And say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Would you pray for me? Believing that the prayer offered in faith by a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.